Marcus. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me out here. Um, this is my first talk, so hopefully it's not too much of a train wreck. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes, though. Um, first of all, you know, uh, a lot of programmers out there um, don't have computer science degrees. You know, a lot of them have degrees in other sciences, you know, physics, chemistry, whatever. You know, some of them don't have any degree at all. So that, uh, that brings me to my first point, which is, uh, oops, the wrong side. Uh, you don't need a degree to define flat map. Um, so so wh when I was introducing Scala, and specifically type level Scala, it's the company I work for, um, I avoided um, what I like to call the, uh, the three M's, which are uh, morphism, monoid, and monad. I don't use those words at all at work. You know, I use them a lot, um, but I just don't say the words. <laughs> um, I, I just, to my coworkers and and those who are who have to interact with with uh, the team and everything, I just kind of coach usage, and it's all about usage, usage, usage. It's not about knowing what's happening and not knowing what's happening. Um, there are a couple of differences between Java and C++ here. Um, I'll point those out when they come up, but they're, they're, they're few and far between. You know, um, the, the biggest thing is that Java people don't understand operator overloading um, for clear reasons, but uh, C++ people do. So you can really like, dig into the, uh, the operators when you're with C++ people, but avoid it with the Java people. All right. um, the first point is uh, immutability as default. Now, what does as default mean? Um, it, it doesn't mean never use a var, and it doesn't mean never use a mutable buffer. All it means is, is you just don't mutate the state outside of its defining scope. You know, so you create a buffer, you don't return a buffer, you know, and you don't take a buffer in as, as input to a function. Um, uh, it, this, this also applies to closures. So any free variables in your closure, don't mutate them. Yeah, you know, just, just keep it scoped, all your mutation. Um, the first little bit of code is very, very Java-like. Um, it's a Java version of one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Uh, the reason this is very Java is because it throws on bad input. Um, we know ahead of time, you know, like w what the good states are. This, the good states represent a space of a sum total of two points. Right? But this function has a, uh, has a prototype that is uh, string cross string, which, is, which has infinitely many points. It's just a bad function. But you'll see, I, I saw a lot of this um, when I first introduced Scala, a lot of people writing stuff like this. Um, we're going to use this in a few of the examples I show um, up until we get rid of the, the throwing and the null and all that stuff. Um, all right. So here we have some typical code that, that, I, that I used to see a lot. Um, on the left, we have some bad stuff. Um, why is it bad? It's because it bre breaks all the immutability rules. You know, we're, we're, we're returning mutable collections. We're taking in mutable collections. We're, we're setting function returns equal to, uh, to vars. You know, we, 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 we want to get rid of all those things. And on the right, we've got, um, we've, we've got some a little bit better code, what it would look like. Um, we create a buffer, but it doesn't exit its defining scope. You know, so it's, it's OK in that case up top, uh, just because you know what's going to happen um, with the buffer. You know what the data is going to look like at all times that the data exists. Um, and that's, that's really the, the key thing. It's just the data and the functionality, just being able to wrap your head around it more easily. And that's what functional programming gives us. Um, it's, it, it just makes things like, um, like multi-threaded programming very, very easy um, in the long run. Uh, so my, the second thing that I coached um, when I brought Scala in is uh, combinators are awesome. Uh, functions produce new state. They don't destroy old state. I, I, I say this a lot at work. You know, um, uh, just don't destroy your old stuff. You want to keep that just in case you need it later or, 
or just to have that pure data around, say you can manipulate it, you can write it to disk, you can, you can do whatever you need on it. Um, methods on, on structures are functions. So all of those rules from the last point apply to methods on functions. You, you, you shouldn't have mutable members inside of your, uh, your classes and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, uh, decoupling data from the usage of that data is uh, really important. It provides the programmer with a lot more power than, um, than if they were to, were to couple the data in. You know, like, like type classes are just way more powerful than subclassing. It just, it's just the way things are. Um, and also, with a, with a simple combinator, you can handle bad state at the call site rather than up the stack somewhere. Um, all right, and we'll see what that looks like a little bit. So on the left, we have what you'll typically see when a Java person first gets into Scala, right? Um, it's, a, it's a very bad fish. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> so the, the, the use case for the data is, is very tightly coupled to the data itself. Like in order to make another fish, you, you, you've got to call the gets on this one, you have to create a new fish, and then you have to call the sets on the new one. You know, everything is, is too linked. Um, uh, there's null here. Um, I hate null. I just, I, I, I can't stand it. Um, <laughs> and because uh, it's, it's just not a value of type string. You can't do, you know, null dot to string. It just doesn't work. It's, it's not a value. So the, the type system is kind of lying to you when you use null. Um, set methods, they destroy old state, um, which, which breaks one of the rules that, that I just outlined here. And um, it poisons threads. Well, it has the potential to, you know, because state's just getting changed all over the place. You don't know what your data looks like when you have your data. There's no, there, there are no guarantees here. Um, and also uh, at the bottom, we have we have some methods that return nothing, and they throw. Like the the function signature means nothing to to the developer using the library that might that might look this way. You know, um, on the right side, the first thing you notice is it's very, very short. Object-oriented people love to type. Um, <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> I don't know why, but they love it. It's, it's, it's crazy to me. But um, if, you have, if you have a boss and they're wary about you know, bringing Scala in and asking, you know, why do we need to change things? Why aren't things good enough now? Just show them this slide. And be like, how much more productive do you think I could be on the right than the left? You know, um, and, and that's a good selling point right there. Um, the function here, the swanfish function, creates uh, a new object. It doesn't destroy old state. You still have your original fish. Um, and that's really important because if another thread is off working on that, it doesn't, it, it doesn't get poisoned by, by whatever you're doing here. Um, uh, so you have you know, thread safety and re reliable data flow. Um, there's no null or throw, except for in the color function, which we'll get rid of later, um, which, which throws a match error on bad input. Um, and the, the usage is decoupled from the data. Whatever function you pass in here is, is up to the, the user of the library. It's not up to you. Um, you can't cover every use case. You can't think of every use case, so you may as well leave it open. Um, and the bad state, from the color function is handled at a construction time instead of later up the stack somewhere where, where it's going to be hard to track down. All right. So the next thing is uh, case classes and traits. So case classes and traits are great because I mean it automatically encapsulates. It does a whole bunch for you. There are there are already um, uh, combinator type functions on them in the in the copy methods, and um, they're immutable by default. Um, so, so you can do a lot of really fancy things with uh, case classes and traits that you maybe could not do if you, um, it, if you had just regular classes. Yeah. Let's see what that looks like a little bit. Here, here are three ways you can make a better um, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. So on the top, on the top left, we have the trait that defines what a fish looks like. On the top right, we've, we, we see our bad case. So, so the, uh, the bad case isn't a fish at all. It's Ahab's white whale. Um, and then we have, uh, 
we have three different ways that we can kind of define our good and bad states. Um, it's done in the type system. It's not done at runtime. So, so there's, there's no reason to even think about what you would throw, when you would throw it, and, and things like that. It just, it, it removes that, I guess, cognitive burden from the developer. You know? and, and I find that, that coaching that is, is really good. Um, people get that a lot, um, especially, especially the Java people, because they, I mean, the, the fact that you have to catch exceptions in Java is, is one of the, its most hated features. Um, so, so people really, really like the, uh, the sum types here. And you don't even have to say some type. It just, <laughs> it just falls out. Um, all right. So all of this, all together, brings me to I guess the uh, the kind of kind of my salient point here. Um, it's that uh, objects are not coroutines. Um, we've all seen code where they're treated as such, where you 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 just you break you throw everything out of the window, all your guarantees that programmer is, is supposed to give you. And you you know you you call something, and that you, you you make an object. You call something on the object. You mutate that object. You call something on the object. You mutate that object. You call something on the object. It's a really 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 messy, you know, uh, series of yields. That's all that is. Um, and treating objects like coroutines leads to a lot of the problems you see um, with with just just debugging. You know, you, you you can't follow code that way. You can't keep it in your head. You can't know what it does. Um, and functional programming gives us a lot of a lot of tools to to solve those problems, so that you never have to deal with them again. Um, and so you can change that habit into you know you define your object, and then you just combinate on it over and over again. Um, all right, you see what that looks like a lot. So this is one big thing, um, and it's bad. It's treating the object. Um, which is a school of fish, as a coroutine. So you can see it, it initializes to, to null, which is typical. Um, you set the values, um, and, then, and then you just kind of com the, the convert to JSON and send on the wire. That has to be, in this case, synchronous. Um, because you don't know how long it's going to take for that to happen. So, and you're, you're uh, mutating the object as you're going through this. You're, you're doing this uh, 10 times. You know? um, so this has to be synchronous. You, you can't possibly make it asynchronous. Um, uh, it's, it's just, it's really messy. It's like a coroutine, but it's just crazy. And um, the data and the functionality, again, here, are coupled instead of being split apart. Um, and we can do it a little bit better if we do it a little bit more like Scala. Um, here, the class at the top um, is just a simple case class. It's just a dumb struct. Um, there's no functionality in it. The data is just data. Um, um, and here, the function, you know, it, it makes new ones, and it just keeps combinating on them to, to produce the new ones. Um, it stores them in a collection, and then it just combinates over that collection to put on on the wire um, for your JSON stuff, for your, and that can be made asynchronous very easily. Um, there's nothing you need to do really, and you have all your old data so that when you get the returns from whatever web service you're sending off to, um, you can compare that. You can make sure you can do better testing here. You know, it's it's just easier. The data flow the data flows more naturally. All right, so. With all of that, you, know, um, you can start bringing in some libraries. Now that you have a, a nice foundation of how to do functional programming, you can now bring in some more complicated libraries to simplify your life a little bit. Um, the first things I brought in were uh, Monocle and Argonaut. Um, it just makes, it's just compositions of case classes are really easy to coach. Um, there's nothing to it. You just put them inside of each other and they work. Um, uh, the, the first question here is, uh, why not Sears? Uh, like I said before, OO people really like to type. And getting, getting uh, for some of them, getting their head around just the auto is really difficult. They're like, where does it come from? It, 
it's 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 really hard. Um, so that could be something you could a step you could try later on, but um, but just introducing it, um, it's it, I found it wasn't a good idea. It just didn't work at all. Um, uh, so what does this look like? Um, this first this this is all the code you pretty much need to define um, what your what, what your settings are going to look like, basically. Um, that's, that's what I use this mostly for, it's just like settings, because you need a persistent setting store when people want to change things with your application. Um, we can see at the top, we have two case classes. Um, it's very small. You know, the, doing this the Java way, the case classes themselves would be longer than this entire thing. Um, uh, we, we define you know, the, uh, the lenses using Monocle, all it takes is a couple lines of code, and and you can get and here I have what nine lenses that I make that are just they're just deep getters basically for elements within there, and these are combinators. Um, the the lenses act as as sort of combinators, so you don't destroy your old state when you make the new ones. Um, that's that's an important thing there, and uh, your your global mutable settings store, which which we've all seen before. Um, it becomes just a set of combinators. Um, and your Aryonaut on the bottom, all you need is uh, two functions at most per class. And the composition here for the, uh, for, for the JSON conversions is implicit. So there's no boilerplate at all with that. Once you make one, um, you, can, you can make lists of it. it. Argonaut knows what to do. And you can compose your case classes and Argonaut knows what to do. So this is kind of what it would look like. So on the left side, we have something synchronous that you'd see, you'd see pretty often. Um, and on the right side, you see something asynchronous. Um, so, so you can see all the things that, that uh, we had before. You know, it's, it breaks one of the rules, which is um, you don't mutate state outside of, um, outside of your scope. You have the settings thing up top which you mutate inside of the update functions under it. Um, and um, I lost my place a little bit. Hold on a second. <laughs> OK, yeah, so you, so you have uh, the, the mutable thing that you, that you mutate. But everything else here is, is pretty clean. It's pretty simple. You know, um, there's, there's not much here. Um, on the async side, uh, I like Akka. Um, you can use whatever you want. but. Uh, um, like I, I, you can do this with um, with tasks in um, Scala Z, and get a very similar result to this. And you can also do it with uh, just plain futures inside of a var. Um, but I, I like Akka because it's it's just really easy to coach um, through how you build an actor an, an actor and how you uh, how you move on from that and the the become and how you combinate in, into the become function so that you can keep everything immutable and know where you are. Um, all right. So the next thing that I did was I coached type classes. Um, they, are, they are probably the most powerful tool for decoupling your data from your functionality. Um, it, it, it's way better than using uh, subclasses. And if you're working with a lot of Java people, you can just, you can just ask. You can analogize this with um, comparator versus comparable, because um, with comparable, when you implement comparable, you can't sort sort that object more than one way. You know, if you need it sorted one way and then maybe the reverse of that somewhere else, um, they can't do that with one class. They have to write two classes which represent the same the same data, and then they have to maintain those two classes. Um, with comparator, they don't need to do that. You define the data in a class, and then you have two comparators to do it. So that's that's the uh, analogy I always use when dealing with, with uh, type classes. Um, your uh, the implicit arguments with type classes are easy because um, it just it it makes sure the the compiler makes sure for you that you have everything in there, and you don't have to do the boilerplate of always typing in the thing over and over and over again. All right, so. What does that look like? So here we have a we have two type classes, um, adder and chainer. Adder takes two things and combines them, 
enchainer takes um, takes something and and given a function, it gives you another one of those things, right? So so here we we see we have two classes which describe the same data, but they um, but they have different different ways of implementing the, the, ty the two type classes. Um, this is bad for the, the reason I just said. Uh, it's just, it, there's too much duplication here. You're too coupled. Um, here, we have the two type classes, and the data is a dump struct again, so that gets simplified right, right off the bat. And then we have a, uh, a, we have structured on the left and, and unstructured on the right, which define the same functionality as the two classes that were in the slide before, but they're separated from the data itself. Um, a lot of you can probably guess um, kind of where this is uh, <laughs> where this is going. Um, wait, hold on a second. Okay, to cats. So, so cats, it's not complicated. It's exactly what we just saw there. We built it. We did. We never used the word monad. We never said monoid. It just. It, it, we just built it up from simple functional programming <coughs> concepts. Um, uh, I, I like to analogize the three M's. You know, say function. It's additive. It has map and flat map. Java people understand this now. That Java eights out and widespread. Um, they they know from a stream and optional what that means and what that does. In C plus plus, there's no real analogy there. Um, but you can describe it using template templates, um, which is really complicated and annoying, but you, you gotta do it sometimes, that's, that's it. Um, you don't have to know the math to be able to use these things. You just, you, you just need to know a couple of very simple concepts and, and you can have a team working on this stuff pretty quickly. Um, and it's just because uh, the, the Scala monad support built in, it's, um, it's basically subclass Polymorphism, not really. It's, it's real. It's structural, but it's pretty much the same thing. Um, the type classes just lend itself to to greater power there, and um, this just looks like this right here. Um, you just define your uh, your simple case class, and um, Cats already has the type classes for you for your for your addable things and your chainable operations. Um, so all you need to do is implement them. And yeah, so in conclusion, um, you don't need a degree to find flat map. You can just find, you can describe these things in very simple ways. Um, you gotta, you gotta be immutable almost everywhere. Um, inside scope, it's okay, but outside of scope, um, it's, it usually leads to problems, especially if your, if your application is asynchronous. Um, use combinators instead of loops, null, and throw. It'll make life a lot easier. You'll, you'll be able to wrap your head around data flow better. And um, case classes do all those things basically for you, so they're a really good tool for getting code out there really quickly. Um, objects aren't coroutines, and you know, monocle and argonaut for settings. Type classes are usually better than subclasses, um, especially if you, if you have third-party libraries and things like that. Um, and CATS gives you all the tools you need for combinability and composability and chaining of operations. All right, and questions and comments? Uh, so it seems like at, at your job you were doing a, a fair amount of um, teaching and, and helping getting um, people onto Scala. Um, and I, I really appreciated one of the points that you were talking about um, with uh, not throwing people into the deep end with like mathematical terms. Um, were, were there specific resources that were you, that you were using to like build a vocabulary to um, help on ramp people, or did you come up with something on your own? Um, I, I just think that that's a very valuable thing to have. I'm not I'm not yeah. personally aware of anything like that. Um, no, I, I didn't really find much of anything. I I searched um, on Google for a very long time, and I didn't really find anything like this. Uh, so I just learned through trial and error, you know, and I learned to ask people what their backgrounds were. You know, that's, that's really key, because given someone's background, it'll, it'll change how you need to communicate them to them, how to, how to talk to them, what words they will know that, that you can expect, you know. Um, so that, that's it. It's just, it's more about 
people. When I, when I first wrote this talk, it was, um, it was very technical. Um, and then I, it got to a point where I, I just, I, I realized that that's not really how I introduced um, type level Scala. I, I introduced it by dealing with people, by doing things that are really non-technical and doing it a lot. Um, so, so it, it kind of changed into this, you know, which, which is not very technical, but it's more about people and, and, and how you communicate with them. So, so no, I, I didn't find anything. I just had to come up with it as I went. Yeah. So in, in the case of like having all of these different ways of doing stuff, because for most people like doing immutable and case classes. So how did you enforce this kind of stuff? Like how did you get people to work like this? Because they probably still have like the yeah. Java and C++ background that they would still like write code as if it was still Java. How did you like get them to, to there? So, so the, the important thing here is, is time. Um, I, I didn't really enforce anything. All I did was I wrote the code that I wrote, um, very functional, um, very type level. And then in order for them to really use any of the libraries I, I would build, they would have to do the same. So uh, it, it's kind of, <laughs> so th they would write a lot of code that was very Java-like, and then they'd hit a brick wall eventually where they had to interact with something I had written. So it's, it's just a matter of time, really. Um, once you get in there, um, uh, the change will happen. You just have to be patient. So uh, in, in avoiding the three M's, which I like totally think that's like a smart approach, um, yeah. <laughs> did you kind of come up with your own like package people would import that had like type aliases and things like that to sort of like change so that people would work with addable or things like that? Or like what, what sort of strategy did you use so that they could kind of implement type class instances without really having to care about that stuff? Or did they just not really use the three M type classes as much? Um, I just analogize them. You know, I say when you see this, it means that. You know, that's, that's all I did, um, um, but, but I see your point. Um, that it, it'd be great to have, you know, just a, just a small jar somewhere they can import, and it just, it just says addable and chainable instead of monoid and monad. Yeah. I think you were next. Yep, thanks. You're, you're a man of great courage. <laughs> I've, I've got uh, <clears throat> 20 years of Java myself and now four years of Scala. Yeah. And maybe you might want to remember when you say that Java programmers like to type a lot. That's not quite true. <laughs> what it is is they don't know that they don't have to. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's an important motivator. If you sh it, All you have to do is show them uh, yeah. how not to type so much. Yeah. And uh, they will bless you. <laughs> <laughs> So a lot of the things you said, like um, you kind of have to remember the person's background, so which you know words they'll pick up on and understand. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of these things seem kind of dependent on like one-on-one -on -one pair programming, or you know, kind of a lot of that takes a lot of time, right? Um, do you view that as something that's just necessary um, to dedicate a lot of time to that, or do you think that some of the stuff can scale a little more and like workshops or have you written up guidelines that people can read or anything like that? Um, th this can definitely scale. Um, I, I found that the first time I, I kind of coached someone through this, it, it, it did take a lot of time and it did take a lot of effort on my part, but um, subsequently it's a lot easier because, the, well, the, I guess the main reason for that is there was all this code already that had already been built up that I could just point to and I could be like, oh, in Java you would do this, and, but in Scala you would do that. You know, um, so, so having that, so ha just having that code to point to, you know, you, you can definitely do this in a workshop setting. You definitely just it, just talk through it a little bit. But really, it's it's um, the, the biggest factor here is time. It's just people need time to get comfortable with a new way of working. You know, some some of these people may never have taken a programming course in their life. But they, they know enough Java to get by, and they've been writing it for you know ten or fifteen years. You, you've got to, you, you have to change that. You know, it's it, it just takes time. That's all. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, I, I love that um, you, you picked Argonaut over Circe because the uh, <laughs> Circe uh, derivation stuff was just too magical. I was yeah. just wondering, I mean, if you were looking for analogies, um, I mean, something that, that, say, Java and C++ programmers, the, they do a lot is they use code generation tools. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could analyze the the, the, the the kind of type class derivation stuff as being, well, it's a kind of code generation, but it just happens, it's not a separate tool. It's just, it's actually sort of built into the library somehow. I mean, that's, which is kind of magic, but it's, it's, yeah. it's more familiar maybe. Yeah, that, that, that actually, uh, I like that analogy because I, the, the main thing I do at my job is I write code generators that generate C++ code. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I get that, I, I understand that wholly. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's a great analogy. Um, I, I, I could definitely like, try to put that in. You know, it's a generator for, it's, it's, it's very meta. Yeah, 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 it's very meta, yeah. I like that. <laughs> Another question. Uh, do you get uh, any pushback from people that genuinely think that object-oriented programming it's better than functional programming or people that are set on their ways? They don't want to like kind of change the paradigm. Yeah. Um, you get a lot of pushback from people who, I guess, evangelize things um, everywhere. Um, so so I, I just... I mean, th that happened when, when there was a big paradigm shift from, from you know, uh, uh, procedural programming to object-oriented programming. It's, it's, it's going to happen. You're going to run into that. Um, you just have to, have to remember you know, what, what you do with, with other evangelists out there. You, you just have to say, like, there's, there's more than one way to do anything. This is another one of those ways, um, and here's how they here's how they map between each other, and here's why this is different. Maybe not better, but different. And you can incorporate that into your tool set as well. Okay. Uh, you mentioned how uh, this ties into Java 8, and that's kind of paved the way a little bit, where it introduces things like optional and flat map. It guides people toward that. That's been great. I've been through that. But one thing that I'm noticing is more people get up to speed on Java 8. I'm having a harder time selling Scala because this meme has gotten out there. Well, Java 8 has lambdas. It has optional, all these things. It's already adopted the best parts of Scala. Everybody in this room pretty much knows why that's not true. But I'm having trouble condensing that down into soundbite form. Have you ever had to do that? What would be your counter argument to that? Um, that lambdas aren't the best part of Scala. I mean, the, in my opinion, the best part is the type system. Um, the fact that you can, the, the, just higher kind of types in and of itself is reason enough to make the move. You know, it's, it, it just simplifies so many problems. Um, you, you can't really do monad programming in Java because of its type system. You know, you, you can't just do, do um, you can't make real combinators in it. Um, and, and combinators are a big part of how I program, of how I just chain operations together, just to get data through in a comprehensive way. Um, so so that's, that's really the killer app of, uh, of Scala, is the type system, not the lambdas. OK, final question over here. Uh, what do you do about tooling? Because, uh, you know, as a Java developer, I depend a lot on the tools, whether it's the IDE or refactoring tools or, or build tools or anything else. Um, how do you migrate to a new tool set and get people comfortable with using a different tool set? Um, I didn't. I, uh, I use Eclipse. Um, so, the, I mean, the, the Scala IDE, there, there's an Eclipse plugin for it. So you just download that, you incorporate it, and then, and then they, can, they just have to pull in their jars the exact same way they would do in Java. Everything else is exactly the same. All the tooling is the same. The IDE does it for them. Um, well, it comes with SBT. Um, the, the plugin actually uses SBT on the back end. So you don't need to, you don't need to teach SBT. Um, that's, that's, <laughs> that's really important. That went a long <laughs> way in switching things over. Just y use an IDE. Um, just, use, just use Eclipse or IntelliJ. It, they do everything for you. So it's, you don't have to switch tooling. Everything just comes out of the box. Yeah. All right, let's thank the speaker.